with CBC being the most ordered test, it's not uncommon to find abnormal cell counts. Most people will quickly understand that low hemoglobin means anemia and high leukocytes might signal infection, but the other abnormalities take a little more to interpret. If, for example, it's in the opposite direction of what's commonly found, it can create some confusion. It's harder to make sense of leukopenia than of leukocytosis, because what comes to mind is that it may represent processes that are more severe, more rare, but also sometimes completely inconsequential. The same applies to the red cell line. Most people will have some confidence on how to work up a low hemoglobin, because while there certainly are some worrisome conditions that need to be considered, they are proportionally much less common than the common causes of anemia. For a high hemoglobin, though, this triggers a bunch of questions in our mind. The first one that pops up is, what is this called again? Is it polycythemia? And isn't polycythemia cancer? Did I just make a cancer diagnosis on this patient? Alright, so this is the crux of the problem to me. The correct name for an elevated red cell count is erythrocytosis, just like an elevated white count is leukocytosis and elevated platelets is thrombocytosis. If we call it polycythemia, it's going to anchor our minds in polycythemia vera, which is only one of the causes of erythrocytosis, so it unconsciously limits our diagnostic thinking. Also, the name polycythemia doesn't really specify which cell line is increased, it just means lots of cells. Of course, you can learn to associate the name of this specific disorder, but I strongly believe that we should try to simplify things so we free up brain power to use it where it's needed. We should always try to free our language of inherent biases if we want to get the clearest picture. Alright, so let's get to it. What are the causes of erythrocytosis? There are four. Hemoconcentration, hypoxemia, perineoplastic, and polycythemia vera. We can organize the causes in many ways, but I find that the most intuitive way to remember is to organize them like this, from least to most specific. So first, hemoconcentration. It's not really a problem of red cells at all. It's just a simple chemistry problem. Same solution, less dilutant, increased concentration. The telltale sign is this. It's someone in whom you'd suspect dehydration. So fluid losses from vomiting, diarrhea, polyuria, and even in general acute illnesses from increased insensible losses and decreased access to hydration. Alright, so here's a question that probably came to your mind. If the erythrocytosis is from hemoconcentration, Shouldn't we expect every single lab value to be concentrated to? So a high white count, high platelets, high sodium, high sugar? It is a good hunch to think that we should, but you're even more right if you made out why it's not the case. Let's think about it. If there was a sudden, instant drop in someone's blood volume without the loss of any solute, then yeah, every single lab would be concentrated. In the actual living organism, though, it's not the case. Everything is tightly and quickly regulated. Sodium, for example, is regulated by ADH and the angiotensin aldosterone system. Sugar is regulated by insulin, glucagon, and other hormones. Potassium is quickly shifted into and out of cells by insulin and adrenaline and regulated by the kidneys. So, if something causes a change in concentration on most of the labs we commonly check, they will already be regulated back to baseline by the time we check them. So, what about the cell lines? Shouldn't we at least see leukocytosis and thrombocytosis? Again, it's a question of regulation and turnover. Red blood cells famously have a lifespan of 3 to 4 months. White blood cells and platelets have a lifespan of hours to days. And they're also more dynamic. You can get reactive leukopenia, leukocytosis, thrombocytopenia, and thrombocytosis in many disease states. So the red cell count is the one that's stable, which means that if we change the amount of the dilutant, it's going to effectively have its concentration changed. Which brings us another question. What regulates the red blood cell count or hemoglobin? Well, the function of red cells is to deliver oxygen, so naturally it's going to be the main thing controlling its production. It's mediated through EPO, which is produced in the kidneys. If the kidneys experience hypoxia, which is the same thing as low oxygen delivery, they secrete EPO, which tells the bone marrow to make more red cells. Secondary to hypoxemia is our second cause of erythrocytosis. The most common underlying cause of this is COPD, but it can be found in anything that causes hypoxemia such as nocturnal hypoxemia from OSA, chronic heart or lung disease, and even kidney-specific hypoxia in renal artery stenosis, for example. Since we talked about EPO, let's go to our third cause. In hypoxemia, EPO is appropriately elevated, but you can also have excess EPO perineoplastically. Perineoplastic EPO secretion usually comes from kidney or liver cancers. The final cause, and also the most specific, is, at last, polycythemia vera. This is simply a red blood cell tumor. 
a clonal neoplastic expansion of red blood cells. It behaves kind of similarly to a chronic leukemia, in which the cell counts are modestly elevated and the disease is not fulminant in weeks to months like acute leukemia can be. The main problems come from hyperviscosity of the excessively concentrated blood and a tendency to form clots. Treatment is based on reducing the red cell mass, either mechanically by phlebotomy or pharmacologically, and aspirin to prevent thrombosis. All right, that is all. As I said, different sources organize the causes of erythrocytosis in many ways, primary versus secondary, primary being polycythemia vera, and all the other ones are secondary. We can say EPO-dependent versus not EPO-dependent, systemic versus neoplastic. But I find that the most intuitive way to remember them down the line is to organize them from least to most specific, so you can kind of think in a stepwise manner, digging deeper physiologically in each step. So first, hemoconcentration, which isn't even a problem of the cell line itself, then secondary to hypoxemia, when it's basically a symptom of an unrelated condition, and then the two tumor-associated conditions. First, a polyclonal cell expansion that is secondary to a distant tumor that happens to secrete APO, and then the primary tumor itself, a clonal expansion of cells. I hope you found this video useful and that your patient experiences its usefulness as well. And as always, use the comment section if you have any questions, and stay tuned to learn more about mysterious and intriguing subjects that you wish were made more clear.